Hello, this is Cool Dude Clem here, and you may remember a couple of videos back I was ranting on about how PCB design programs suck. Well, I take back most of what I said. Many of you offered helpful suggestions, and one of you sent me the full version of PCB Wizard and Livewire, so a big thanks goes out for that, and I thank the rest of you for your comments and suggestions. Anyway, I've been playing around with these two programs, getting to know them, and found it's been really user-friendly and easy to use. So, let's take a little look. So, this is Livewire, and basically what it's for is making your own circuits up. Now, to keep things short, I'm just going to load up a circuit here. Um, let's just see if I can find it. Okay, I think it's this one. Yep, here we are. Okay, I'll just close the gallery for now because we won't be needing that and get this centered a bit better so you can see what we're doing here or at least what I'm doing here. So, as you can see, I've designed a little circuit here. This is an amplifier which is based on one of Radio AM232's circuits. He's no longer on YouTube so I cannot post any links to it but this is basically one of his circuits. The only change I've made is move a wire that connected the positive to this resistor here, I've moved that wire here so it's now a bootstrap circuit, but we won't get into all that right now. Anyway, this program is really easy to use. You just pick the parts you want, drop them, move them into place, wire them, even rotate them if necessary, and of course you can select whatever particular component you need. If I right click on, say, this transistor here, I can go into models and I get a whole list of transistors that I could use. And some of that list is out of the video capture, but you get the general idea. The only transistors that don't appear to be in this program's database are TIP3055 and TIP2955, but that's not going to really be a problem. In the schematic I'll just use a TIP41 or a TIP42 instead, and then after the PCB has been made, I'll simply connect a TIP29 or 3055 to the PCB with wires, and obviously make sure it's wired up properly. Of course, there's more to this than just designing circuits. You can test them too with the built-in simulator, which is a nice feature. That means you can build almost any circuit you want, and test it in the simulator, and there's no risk of blowing anything up or electrocuting yourself, come to that matter. As you can see, I have a few things connected to this circuit. I have a signal generator over here, a voltmeter, and an oscilloscope. And the oscilloscope's display will show up on this graph here. And I have the current flow view selected. And that will show you which way the current is going, if any. So, anyway, let's run the simulation and see what happens. Well, as you can see, there's nothing really showing up on the graph yet other than a straight line. That's because I have the input turned all the way down, which is this potentiometer here, and this one here sets the bias. And when I adjust it, if you notice over at the voltmeter, when I adjust this, the output voltage also changes. Now for a circuit like this, it's best to have the output voltage at half of the input voltage, so I'm going to put that back to where it was. That's about the best I can get it in the simulation, about 85%. As you can see, we've got about 10.8 volts at the output there. And when the simulation is running, you can view current and voltage anywhere in the circuit. If I hover the mouse over any of these components, we can see how much current is going through them. Okay, well, we should be able to. I think with my screen capture running, it's not going to show us. I um, think I'm going to have to switch over to the camera here because the, this doesn't seem to want to do it with the screen capture running. Okay, sorry about that. Now, I hope you can see this alright. Now, like I was saying, when you're running the simulator, I mean simulation, or whatever you want to call it, you can monitor current and voltage going through any part of the circuit. If I hover the mouse over any of the components, we can see how much power is going through each part. As you can see, at the output transistors, we don't have much power going through them. This one is about 49, well, almost 50 milliwatts, and this one, 
about 57 milliwatts. So, this amplifier appears to have good quiescent current. And if I hover the mouse over any of the wires or the connections, we can see how much voltage is going through. And of course, the current as well. So, if I want to test the voltage at this transistor here, at the base of this transistor here, I put the mouse there and as you can see, or probably can't see, we have 11.46 volts and at the base of this transistor here we have 664 millivolts. And that seems pretty accurate. I have built the circuit in real life and got almost identical results. In fact, I've simulated quite a few circuits on this that I've built and well it seems to simulate those quite accurately as well. Right, you can now see that I've removed the signal generator in the oscilloscope because let's say I want to create a PCB of this circuit. Actually I'm not going to make a PCB of this circuit but I am going to demonstrate how it would be done. You can see I've put a connector here and I've put a couple of terminals here this one is labelled out and if you notice this one is also labelled out this means that these two are connected together so there's no need for a big wire going all the way around to connect it to the connector so anyway when you're happy with the circuit you can go into tools and convert and as you can see the only option is design to printed circuit board so we'll click on that and I'm just gonna have everything automatic for now of course there's manual but we're just going to do it automatically for quickness. So, when I click on Convert, it brings up PCB Wizard and starts placing all the parts on the board. And when it's done that, it will attempt to route all the traces. As you can see, it hasn't managed to route them all, but um, it tries to do its best. And if we go into real world view, you can see more or less how this is going to look. Now I'm not happy with where some of these parts are placed so I'm going to move them. So the first thing to do is go into tools and unroute all nets. I'm going to move these parts to where I want them and I'm going to stop recording while I do this. Well I think this is a much more logical way of laying out the components. I've spent a few minutes rearranging them. Now I'm going to try to make it auto route the traces again. So, go to auto root, root all nets, and I'm going to say allow tracks to be placed diagonally this time, and let's see what it does. And there we go, it was able to root all the connections without having to use any jumper wires, and we now have a circuit board ready to be printed. Now, the more observant of you might have noticed that it appears that the circuit traces are on the same side of the board as the components. Well, that's not actually the case. I believe what we've got here is we're looking at the board as if it was transparent and the traces are actually on the other side. If we take a look at the component side artwork, all you can see is the holes where all the parts are going to go. And if we take a look at the solder side artwork, that's solder side, not solder as some of you say there you can see all the traces. Again we're looking through the board as if it was transparent but anyway let's move on to a little project that I'm going to try to do with this obviously it's not this one. Now here we have a little circuit that I've designed it's a 555 based oscillator that runs at about approximately 17 kilohertz. I've experimented with different capacitors here to get different frequencies and then compared it with the signal generator running at 17 kilohertz and this seems to come pretty close I'm designing the ideal driver circuit to drive a TV flyback transformer and 17 kilohertz is usually the best um, I've heard it's usually the best frequency to use also I've got a duty cycle that's less than 50 percent thanks to this diode here and with the current resistor and capacitor combination like I said before I've got a frequency that's very close to 17 kilohertz and a duty cycle of about 25 percent so it should work pretty well or at least I hope it does I just hope the 555 chips I've got will accept being connected up this way because I've heard only the CMOS ones will work if you do this anyway let's try to make this into a PCB firstly I've just got to remove all the other parts that 
are not going to be in the circuit. Okay, as you can see, I have now disconnected all the parts that are not going to be used. Now, let's convert this to a PCB. This time I'm going to say yes, I want to decide, um, decide on how my design is converted. That's all okay. That's all okay. That's all okay. I'm going to check all of those. I'm going to say I want the tracks to be placed diagonally. Now that should be all done. Okay, I'm ready to convert it to a PCB now. So it brings up the program. Starts placing all the components. And there we go. I'm even going to give this a name. After all, there's a big empty area of the board there. Might as well do something with that. Let's just move it there. As you can see, it's back to front. So that backs up what I was saying earlier about seeing through the board as if it was transparent. This is the real world view. As you can see, there are a couple of wire links that are going to have to be inserted. But that's not going to be a problem. Anyway, I'm going to see if I can print this out and etch this onto a board. And that's just about it for the review of these two programs. On the whole, um, I think I'm going to be very happy with them. But stay tuned for the next episode of Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop because I'm going to try to etch a circuit board that I made with that program. But until next time, goodbye.